it's going to also. Okay. All right. Um, so good evening from South Africa, and I believe good morning from Canada, and good day to everyone from all over the world. Um, hello and a warm welcome to you all. My name is Lindy Grieber, and I am the Research Forum Lead for the Good Governance Academy. Um, today, we are delighted to be hosting another webinar entitled Good Governance for Forward-Looking Leaders. And I must say, I'm personally extremely curious and excited about today's webinar. Um, it will be facilitated and presented by Prof. Cesar Boschkes and Prof. Douglas Fluke. I hope I got that right, <laughs> Fluke. Okay, so... As always, it's great to have so much interest in our events, and it's nice to see so many returning guests. Please do let us know where you're from in the chat window below. Um, I hope it's um, not as hot on your side as it is at the moment in Johannesburg in South Africa. So while we wait for all our attendees to enter the lobby, um, just a bit of background. Um, well, yeah. I'll share some tips for those not familiar with Zoom. If you can see the control panel on your screen, please press the Alt key on your keyboard. That'll give you access to the chat box, the question box, and reaction buttons. Our speakers love to see your reactions, so do, do please make use, good use of these. Also, if you have any questions during the event, please pop these in the question box, and I'll be, I'll be happy to ask these during the Q&A session later on if there's time left, and um, I'm sure our presenters would also love engage, to engage with you. And um, free, free feel to use the chat box as well, together with the Q&A. Okay, so um, let's have a look at our chat box <laughs> and see, um, let me just get there as well. <laughs> okay, so we have Hi, Damien from the Czech Republic, wonderful. And Huey, for, if I got that right, from Malaysia, Windsor from Ontario, Canada. Oh, Gary, yes, from um, Windsor, Ontario. Um, Harari, Zimbabwe, also Ontario. Greetings from um, Tabi Singh here in South Africa. Also, Joburg from Zoran. I hope I get these names right, everyone. <laughs> Gavin from Dubai, we have. So that's fantastic. Um, I'm still going to give it another minute or so to allow all our attendees to be able to join. Oh, lovely. We have Baba Prasad from Sydney. You're a regular, Baba. It's always lovely to see you on our calls. Christopher from Johannesburg. And, oh, Christopher Minsok, Ghana. Yeah, it's just so many from all over. <laughs> Okay, I think um, we are more or less here, um, but as, as we still allow attendees to enter the chat, let's start our webinar. Um, once again, Douglas and Prof. Cesar, it's lovely to have the both of you here. It's really a privilege to us, and we're really keen on sharing the knowledge and information with our audience. So thank you so much for, the, for being here. I'm going to hand over to Cesar. Um, please introduce yourselves, if you don't mind, and over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Lindy. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to welcome all our participants from all over the world, actually. It's so happy to uh, have uh, different countries joining our session. You are all welcome. Uh, I am Sezer Boskush uh, originally uh, Turkish. Uh, and located uh, in Izmir and uh, working as an associate professor in Izmir Bakırca University. At the same time, uh, I'm part of the Good Governance Academy research uh, platform uh, and contributing as steering committee member. Uh, so today, it's our uh, real honor to welcome uh, distinguished guest speaker Prof. Douglas Fluke, and uh, with uh, his uh, experiences uh, regarding the good governance with forward-looking leaders. And in uh, this respect, um, he has a different style. I know that from his books because 
I'm one of the reviewer of uh, his book and shared it via, uh, you know, social media. You can read my opinion as well. And that's why I uh, just wanted to uh, invite him as our uh, guest speaker, uh, not only uh, for me, but for also all of you globally to know about Douglas leadership philosophy, which is quite different and uh, value added compared to other, you know, traditional uh, style. And uh, we will be hearing from him. Uh, he's, of course, uh, telling us uh, much more thing. Uh, but as you see, the leading with my best self, modeling the behavior I seek from others and creating environments where others can succeed. It's not only um, himself, but considering for others success is uh, the key. And um, it's also um, explained in uh, his uh, book series. Uh, you can see uh, from the details, it's from Taylor and Francis, uh, which is quite uh, you know well-known uh, book publication. Uh, series and uh, in that respect, uh, considering our limited time, I prepared some key questions to focus on our session, starting from, um, you know, what qualities are needed to specifically being a natural leader, and we should uh, understand the leadership style and the difference to make it uh, value added for. Uh, him or herself, and also for the organization. And considering the uh, digitalization, what are the commonly misunderstood issues and mistakes in leadership? And how can a connection be established between uh, corporate governance principles and leadership principles? As you know, we are a good governance academy. We are contributing to the uh, best practices of the good governance um, and the old principles, procedures, and practices. Uh, and our research platform uh, is established for this uh, purpose. And uh, in in that sense, I would like to invite all um, you know uh, participants today uh, to come and join uh, our uh, research platform. Uh, either to uh, do your own research or uh, join and get some idea about that. And we really appreciate your um, contribution uh, to make it uh, as a, a good governance practice uh, with uh, global contributions. And uh, the last question, how can leadership characteristics be developed? It should be um, for the lessons learned and we can get some advice and what is the path to achieving this so thank you very much for um, joining us and uh, I would like to give uh, the floor to our um, distinguished guest speaker Douglas Luke floor is yours thank you Thank you so much for having me and uh, welcome from uh, this little place called Bablo Island. It's just outside of Windsor, Ontario, Canada. And I'm, I'm really honored to be able to speak with all of you today. I'm not going to speak to you because that's one way communication, but we're going to speak with each other. So I do hope that you have the opportunity through the different uh, means to ask me some questions. I'm a very transparent type of a leader. And, uh, you know, some of the best successes I ever had in leadership came as the opposite to some tremendous failures. And we're going to share some of those as we move forward today. One of the key themes that's always about me is about moving forward and how we're going to pivot towards being the best version of ourselves. Um, this is me all the time with the energy that I have. I'm not on any medication, so I hope that I'm speaking slow enough and I'm articulating enough so that you can truly hear my message, but uh, kind of strap your seatbelts on because this is going to be one heck of a passionate uh, rocket ship ride uh, moving forward. About uh, 15 years ago, I realized that uh, as a police officer, I was a sergeant in a city called Guelph, Ontario, that I had an expiry date. And all too often when we get into businesses, we forget that uh, or we ignore that we all have expiry dates. 
getting ready for that. I've always been a person that tried to plan two or three years in advance. I went to Cornell University and I enrolled in a program to get a certificate in executive leadership. At that time, one of my professors asked me a very profound, life-changing question. And they said, what leadership style are you? So I started to think back. I played football in university. I wrestled in university. I was a police officer. I was an elite coach of some uh, National Hockey League hockey players. And I thought to myself, I really don't have a style. So I started to do some research and I found out that my leadership style is kind of like uh, Bruce Lee, who practiced Jun Kit Do. And his style was the style of no style. And back in the days when Bruce Lee was doing martial arts and, and winning in, uh, international awards, people were, were, were met by the fact that he could be the style of no style and be successful. And at that point, I started to adopt the leadership mantra to myself that I'm going to be the style of no style where I'm going to take the best of everything that I've experienced. I'm going to take it, tweak it, make it better, make it my own. And if I would experience bad leadership, I was going to do the opposite because I knew how that would make me feel. So the paper at that time was to create my personal mantra, which you've heard. I always try to lead with my best self. I try to model the behavior I seek of others. I always try to create an environment where other people can succeed because when we get into a leadership role, the me gets promoted, but we no longer think about me once we're promoted to a supervisor. We have to start to think about the we and the us of our organization. But the underlying piece to all that as well is that we've got to take care of ourselves before we take care of others. And with that, I, in my new book, I talk about holistic leadership that if I want to be the best version of myself tomorrow and every day for the rest of my life, I truly have to um, uh, be respectful of my heart, my body, and my mind. You know, we've got to get some physical fitness. We have to have positive in going into our body through nutrition, through environments. We have to be spiritually sound. We need to sit and take some time back and reflect, uh, do some positive mindset. But then beyond that, we have to go out there and be the best version of ourselves. With that, I, I looked at who I was no longer exists. My experiences that bring me today and even yesterday, I am not the same person I was yesterday because who I was created who I am today. And who I am today is going to create who I'm going to be tomorrow. So in that spirit, my life mantra is who was I? Who am I? Who do I want to be moving forward? And that's going to be based on leading with my best self, modeling the behavior I seek of others, always create an environment where other people can succeed. Because when we become leaders, it's no longer about us. It's about them and creating an environment where they can succeed. But to do that, we also have to make sure that we're sound in our heart, our body, and our mind and take care of ourselves to be the best version of ourselves. If I go into work in a bad version of myself, I'm going to be setting consciously and subconsciously negative atmospheres in that office. So if I can strive to be the best version of me, hopefully others are going to follow that and be the best versions of themselves so that at the end of the day, what our outcomes are, we're going to have more profit margins. We're going to have better quality control. We're going to have whatever our organization is there to strive to succeed. Hopefully we can create the environment where others can succeed and down the road, we all are going to win. So uh, after listening to you, it's not that easy to, uh, you know, coordinate your body, your, you know, mind and uh, the atmosphere you are in. Uh, what is your recommendation for participants to, you know, cope with this kind of uh, discrepancies? Yes. Uh, how can we um, solve the problems and um, challenges actually uh, within the uh, business environment? And even in the digital platforms, make it more, you know, uh, difficult to show your feelings, your mindset and everything. So what is your recommendation, Douglas? Over the course of my police career, I had some horrific calls for service where, you know, I, I've had people literally die in my presence. Um, one time there was a situation that I related to too personally. And I took it on as one of my own family members had passed away. After that, I went into some, some very self-abusive behavior where I was drinking too much. And I was drinking alcohol not to get drunk, but to feel numb because I just didn't want to sleep. And I wanted to go to, I wanted to just go to sleep. Uh, luckily, my mom came forward and she said, you know, you're not the good version of yourself. You're not putting good things into your body. You're not thinking good things into your mind and, and into your spirit. So I went and I met this incredible counselor for PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, Mary Margaret. And we examined a lot of those factors and I realized several key things. I realized that sometimes I can't control what's going to happen, but I can control how I respond to that. 
So as a leader, sometimes things are going to happen. We can't control, but we can control how we respond to it. If someone comes to you in your, your workplace and starts yelling and screaming, ask your, take a step back. Don't yell and scream back. Ask yourself, why are they doing that? Because if we understand, like Simon Sinek talks about, if I understand why people are upset, I'm going to know how and what to do to help them moving forward. When I was in that pit of darkness, as I like to call it, it's like almost if you can visualize being in a dark room. We want to find the light switch, so we go around the walls and we try to flip that light switch on, but I learned that that light switch does not exist on the walls as in the period of darkness. It exists within ourselves. And when we explored that exercise, and this is one thing I want to give homework to everyone who's listening right now. Great, Doug's giving us homework. That's fantastic. But this was the defining process that I went through that took me from being a victim of the situations that occurred in my life to being a survivor. And I want us all to be survivors moving forward. My counselor asked me what my four core values were. And I thought, well, I really don't understand what you mean. And she said, you're in here just criticizing yourself mercifully. And I don't like what you're saying to yourself. She goes, next week, I want you to bring, have you ever received a letter or a piece of uh, thanks from a member of your community? So I went in and I brought uh, several cards and she pulled this one card out. And it took me back to a time, I think in 1997, where there was an accident, a fellow had uh, basically um, had a heart attack. He smashed into the front of a building and his two children were in the back of, of that car. I think they were five and six years of age. We had teddy bears in the back of our police cars. And, and once the emergency services took over to help this gentleman, I went to the back of my car and I got those two teddy bears out and I gave it to both the little girls. Two or three days after that, the gentleman was fine. Uh, he had the medical help that he received, but I received this incredible letter from these children and every letter was spelled in a different color of crayon. And it was ironic because Mary Margaret, my counselor, this was in 2007, 2008, she went into the bag, she pulled out that very card and she read it and she looked at me and said, don't ever tell me again that you don't matter. Look what you did for these two little girls in a very uh, emergent time in their life. You created calm and chaos. And as a leader, that's one of our jobs is to create calm and chaos. So the homework is, Mary Margaret asked me what my four core values were, and that's the foundations for my first book. Finding your granite, we meaning finding that place where you can stand and you're really firm, my four cornerstones of personal leadership, and those are my core values. So what that means to me, I try to be honorable in everything that I do. I try to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, and I would challenge everyone to have honor. Integrity is what we do when no one's watching. And now when you look across social media, you'll see people, they'll go up to someone who's homeless and they'll go, look at me, look at me, I'm giving this homeless person a chocolate or I'm giving them a pair of shoes. Well, if you're going to do that, don't do it and broadcast it because there's no integrity there. Integrity to me is what you do when no one's watching. And as a leader, that's huge. Passion, I think you guys can get from my personality. I always try to be passionate in everything that I do. But then accountability is the last one for me. I'm accountable to everyone who I want to make proud of me. I'm accountable to all 37 people on here today. So I look at it that if I go into a situation as a leader, if I come in and after today's uh, webinar, some person might say, I don't like this guy. And I'm okay with that because we're not meant to win every situation. Sometimes the timing is wrong. We're not meant to win today, but we're meant to set up for victories down the road. And I will sit back and reflect on myself instead of doing self-abusive behavior or drinking too much or, you know, smoking or just doing bad things where I'm going to physically mention spiritually harm myself. I will reflect and say, did I treat everyone today with honor? Yes. Did I treat them with passion? Yes. Did I treat them with integrity and accountability? Yes. As I reflect back on reading that, I'm really never ever going to lose as a leader. And I say that to everyone. When you get your four core values, you might not win all the time, but maybe it's not the time to win. But I can sit back and not be self-abusive to myself and my heart and my body and my mind because I know I tried my best. I imprinted my four core values, and that's my recipe in everything that I do. If I go through a situation, whether I win or I lose, I will reflect. Did I have honor, integrity, passion, and accountability in those situations, and I'm never truly going to lose. So I do hope that people have my contact information, that you send me your core values and why, and I would love to have some dialogue with people to further uh, explain those moving forward. Please join us with sharing your values. Uh, you can use uh, comment box. Thank you. And uh, by the way, um, when you are uh, saying this, I was thinking about my own journey and, you know, business communications and everything. Uh, I used to be an advisor and auditor. 
And in the field works, usually our approach uh, is to improve the corporate governance, you know, uh, implementations within the organizations so that uh, we ask uh, key questions, the things you can control, yes. the things you cannot control, and the half controllable, you know, gray areas. Uh, these are uh, quite critical to establish your risk management strategy and the position within the organization, because whenever you take a critical decision, you need to consider the controllable issues and uncontrollable ones uh, so that you are in the uh, safe position and uh, not, uh, you know, disappoint uh, any of your colleagues or your, you know, management board and everybody. So in that respect, uh, it's quite important to uh, understand the big picture. It's uh, not only you, but uh, there are others around you. So uh, it's uh, all about feeling and understanding. You don't face with the walls, but you face with uh, human beings. You need to uh, get some kind of, you know, interaction depending uh, on your, um, you know, position. Sometimes it's the body language. Sometimes uh, the way you uh, speak uh, makes the difference, I believe. And uh, as you mentioned about your um, values, uh, uh, value um, edit approach and value uh, creation or value generation process is also uh, important. Uh, some people may uh, find it difficult to decide for their you know, values uh, because there are some uh, conflicting issues, cultural issues, and uh, you know many other things can be um, uh, said here. And uh, what can be your recommendation to, uh, you know, solve uh, conflicting areas and the gray areas, Douglas? If you are, that's a, you know, that's... It, it's a controllable or uncontrollable, it's, it's okay. But when it comes to half, you know, and the gray uh, areas, it's also ethical issues come to picture. Yes. Conflicts come into picture. How can we, you know, be on the safe side and um, maybe not, um, you know, a uh, winner, but uh, we don't want to be the loser and uh, we don't want to uh, behave unethically, let's say. How can we uh, the good uh, respond to this? Thank you. That's a fantastic question. And I, um, my daughter, my eldest daughter is 28. And when she was young, she decided that she wanted to play soccer or football. I had no clue, but I was a fitness trainer for elite athletes. So I said, just I'll help out. I always thought it was absolutely ridiculous that a zero zero game was a good game. And, uh, you know, I'm like, how can that be? You got to win. There has to be a winner. There has to be a loser. And then, you know, as I grew up and I became a police officer, I had a, an incredible person in my life said, Doug, now that you're a police officer, I want you to make sure that every life you come into, you make better than worse. Initially, I thought, yeah, that's great advice. But that set me up to fail. And that was an albatross. That was an anchor on my neck. Because sometimes in life, I was not going to win. Sometimes in life, if someone died in front of me, I can't bring them back to life. So my version or my definition of the win was all IQ based. A plus B equals C. And we will make sure. But sometimes A plus B doesn't equal C. And as I moved through life, I started to um, combine the IQ with the EQ on human beings and human feelings. So I had to redefine the win. And once I started to redefine the win and realizing that a draw like soccer, zero to zero, was actually a good thing, I started to incorporate more of the EQ into it and started to look more at the human feelings. So instead of me coming in there and saying, you made a mistake, how do we fix it? We went in there and not so much the A plus B linear thinking. We went in there, it was just like, okay, we weren't that successful. Why do you think that happened? What could we have done differently? What could we do better next time? What did we like that we did? And bring more of a cerebral approach to conflict management that if you walk in there and I say, you messed up, I've just shut you down. That meeting is over. I'm never going to, I may never get you back. But if I realize and I come in and say, hey, Cesar, you know, two weeks ago, you knocked that project out of the park. 
this last one we did wasn't that successful. Where do you think we can make it better next time so we can replicate what we did before? Well, okay, Doug, let's talk. And that's where a lot of my, like I'm 58 years of age, a lot of the 1980s leaders, they did a lot of really good things, but they still didn't master EQ or emotional quotient and things. And we shut people down. If we can go in there and redefine what the win is, because that the win for me is if you and I can come in to a situation that could be incredibly uh, filled with conflict, but we leave with mutual consensus. We learn with how we both move forward. And that's why I use that word all the time, move forward. How do we pivot towards a positive situation? It doesn't matter that we have to win all the time, but how do we move forward together? Because that's the thing. A good leader creates an environment where other people can succeed. And if I come in and I shut you down, I shut our colleagues down, that unit is going to fail and I'm going to fail. As a good leader, when we look at like the National Football League, a lot of time the good coaches don't get hired by other teams. It's the subject matter experts that they surround them by. Those good coaches and GMs create an environment where other people can succeed and then you get team success. And as again, I said, when you redefine what winning truly is, maybe a zero zero draw is what we need more in business because that gives us both power, it gives us integrity, it gives us a voice and together we can go out there. The other thing is we we're talking in, in, in the chat room beforehand, I love the story about Nelson Mandela and he talks about his father. He said that when he would go around as a small child to the different tribes, his father had three different rules. They would always sit in a circle so there wasn't a, a, a table sitting across from each other. The second one he said is my father always would pose a question, then he would be quiet and he was always the last to speak. And as they went around the circle, everyone had the opportunity to express their opinions. There could have been the same opinion that his father wanted at that time, but it wasn't him telling people or talking to his, his chieftains, it was speaking with them. So there was consensus together where you can actually say, Cesar, that was a good point. Lindy, do you wanna build on that? And it becomes collaborative all the way around. And as a leader, God gave us two ears and one mouth, so we should listen twice as much as we speak. This was something 40 or 50, 60 years ago. But as I'm seeing moving forward in leadership, not everything that was old was bad. We need to, as I said at the beginning, take some of the bad, take it, tweak it, make it usable, make it actionable for ourselves and move forward. And if we see the bad things, we have to have the insight to slow those down so that we don't make those same mistakes our predecessors did and we don't hurt people's feelings. Because if you hurt people's feelings, they're going to take it personally. They're going to take it professionally. If you do it in an open form, you've made fun of them in front of their colleagues. And then, you know, then, the, then their colleagues aren't going to speak up because they're going to say, I don't want to speak up because I saw how they treated Cesar the other day. So a positive leader, if you go in there and always think about we and then think about us, then you're going to get success. So never forget behind every position that you supervise, there's a human being that has a family, that have hopes and dreams and aspirations. And it's your job to get them to buy into your inspired vision, like Kuzis and Posner would say, I'm going to tell you what my goals and objectives are. See if your goals and objectives and how we can bridge that and make those in alignment, because that's where success and a good team is born. Yeah. And uh, Derek Pigasso uh, from uh, the chat uh, box Respect all humans as we are all created equal. Thank you very much for your contribution. It's also important to remember that we should respect each other as all human beings. Uh, we should be treated equally. This is part of uh, good governance principles and sustainability as well. Thank you very much uh, for mentioning this fact. And also uh, my own practice, Whenever uh, I feel, you know, in the gray area or in difficult situation, I don't want to uh, hurt anybody. Then I start counting uh, within myself one and two and three up to ten. And now I don't want to say anything. Just be silent and relax and keep the distance so that you never hurt anybody. You respect each other, and even you want to, you know, continue uh, that conversation. You can wait and, and then uh, make it happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's always good to um, listen twice, and then uh, decide uh, what to say or not to say. Is sometimes uh, compared to, you know. Uh, 
gold and silver uh, we have a turkish saying if you want to uh, you know uh, say something is silver but uh, silence is the gold and gold is the most valuable uh, you know creature so uh, that's that's what i mean uh, always uh, just remembering that uh, we have feelings and uh, we should be careful about our uh, relationship. Once uh, we achieve this uh, strength and integrity within ourselves, I'm sure uh, everybody will uh, also respect this uh, positioning and, you know, being um, so um, caring and understanding approach uh, will reflect to you uh, whatever you uh you know feel and uh, whatever you uh, just show as a reflection of your body and yeah. mindset and that's a really good point and i think that people have to realize and, and i love what derek said that, that we're all human beings there was yeah. a gentleman that i used to arrest all the time uh, in guelph early in my career uh, he was addicted to heroin and every Monday, I would look at what crimes happened on the weekend, and he would always break through a basement window, steal compact discs and VHS tapes. Then he would take them down and turn it in for money. And I remember I would catch him every Monday. I'd call him and say, hey, so-and-so, you were busy this weekend. Well, Officer Flug, what do you mean? I said, you broke in this place, this place, this place. How did you know that? Well, and again, not being rude, but he's so high, you never realized that his, his MO or his method of operation was just like fireworks every time. And, you know, he said... Um, you know, thank you for treating me with respect and dignity. And in the end, they would always sentence him and make him go to the methadone clinic downtown Guelph. And one day he called me up and he was high and he said he was thinking about taking his life. And he's just like, why did they keep setting me up to fail? I need to go to a different methadone clinic because I go to the peers that help me be bad. So I went and I talked to his bail, uh, excuse me, his probation officer. And they ended up getting him in a community about 45 minutes away where he went there then I didn't see him for a lot of years. One night I had arrested someone for drinking and driving. We called a tow truck from this gentleman shows up. And I'm like, what's going on? And he had said that because he was removed from the negative environment, he found this little word called hope. And I think hope is one of the most powerful, small words that people miss out on. And it was such a great lesson for me because he had said that once I got out of that environment, I was able to stay clean. I got full custody of my daughter again. Now I've got a job and I'm doing fantastic. So it was right around when I was retiring from the Guelph Police Service. So I said, hey, uh, I have a charity event. It was a rock concert for a charity that I invented. And I said, you know, I'm using this. So he showed up. Several police officers saw him there like, why is he here? He's a he's a criminal. I said, no, he's just lost some or someone who lost hope. Because everyone we deal with, generally, you're dealing with them on their worst day. They're either the victim of physical violence, sexual violence, addictions, or whatever, mental health issues. But we can't discount the human being just because something is happening. And one of the officers who I didn't like anyway said, well, if he's staying here, I'm leaving. I went, bye, you know, and he left. But when I took that small word of hope, I looked at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I use this to instruct a lot of people. As we see Maslow's hierarchy of needs, your basic level is uh, food, shelter, and water. I have amended Maslow's model to have a pyramid, but it's also got a basement. And you think about basements, that it's a foundation. And a lot of people's foundations are filled with like, if, if the analogy, it's like your basement is flooded. If your basement, your home is flooded, your furnace isn't gonna work, your electric's not gonna work, you're not even gonna see that there's a set of stairs that take you up to those base levels. And a lot of people that I would deal with, whether they were homeless or I was a Special Olympics coach for 30 years, they had lost hope because their basements were flooded with whatever the noise was, whether it was addictions, uh, uh, mental health issues. And if we can help people get the water out of that basement, then they're going to see hope and they're going to see that staircase of hope that take them up to their base levels. Because if we don't help them, we all know that if a, a foundation is sitting there and we don't clear the water, eventually the foundation walls are going to collapse and the pyramid's going to collapse on itself. So we as leaders, we as human beings, if we can look and ask why someone is going through what they're going through, then we know how and what to do. 
But if I walk into the uh, situation and I say, hey, Cesar, come to my office. You don't look like you're on, on your game today. Is everything okay? Well, actually, I've got a problem. I'm taking care of my elderly mother. Then let's talk about that. Or I've lost a parent. Forget about the business because you're going to be impaired by the fact that you're losing hope or your situation. Take 10 or 15 minutes. Talk with someone. Maybe you can give them an objective view. And just think about it. If you're a supervisor and someone shares with you some of their personal stories and asks for your advice, what an incredible honor that someone says, hey, Doug, can you help me with this problem? So after you sit and debrief, I bet you once we talk for a half an hour, you're going to give me seven and a half hours of great work in that office instead of worrying about your mom the whole day. And so as future leaders, always remember that hope is infectious. And if you can teach people hope, Man, oh man, that's a springboard to going up to their basic needs of life, of food, shelter, and water. And then eventually they're going to get those higher levels where at the top they're going to get self-actualization. You get to be the conduit and the tour guide into some people's lives and help them get something such as base as hope uh, and, and to move forward. So, you know, that's where the holistic side of leadership comes through. A plus B equals C. It's always been that way. It's always going to be that way. But how do you have value added to your supervisory skills? And that's looking at the person as a human being first, who happens to be an employee. Don't look at them as an employee who happens to be a human being. Yes, we have other contributions, Agnes, Tai, uh, in addition to respect uh, that Drake suggested, accountability, uh, positive energy, as Doug mentioned, integrity pointed out, uh, this is a must. Open-minded, unwearing hope, it's a remarkable story of a life turned around. Great job, Derek, again, contributed. Thank you very much. We are expecting much more. Please join us. Thank you. Would you like to make additional comments about uh, Agnes' uh, accountability, positive energy, integrity, open-minded and uh, unwavering hope? I think, Agnes, you've done a fantastic job, and I love those, and I bet you those are your five core values. But I'll let you we'll have artistic license today, and you don't have to send me your four. You send me your five. But you and I are speaking from the same cloth, and, and I think that's absolutely amazing, that accountability. And, and I saw a Matthew McConaughey video one time, and he said accountability to him are the people he wants to make most proud of him. And I look at that. There's so many people in my sphere of influence that truly believe in me, truly invest in me. And I want to make them proud. I want to make them proud today. And I invited some of them for here today as well. E energy. Energy is infectious. When you go into a room, if you're negative and down, it's almost like that old A.A. Uh, a. a. Millen, uh, um, Winnie the Pooh, Eeyore, that walks around with a cloud. Oh, my God, life sucks. Well, if you come in in a negative attitude, you're going to people are going to mirror that. So as a, as a leader, you know, I, I, someone I read an article one time that said leaders aren't allowed to have bad days. I think you can have a bad day, but you can't infect people with that. And that's the same thing. When you're a leader, uh, going into a, a, an employee meeting and being biased about their supervisors or just being biased about your experience and being negative, you do not have the right to poison those people you work for. And I said that. People who, who I work with, they don't work for me. I work for them because, remember, we're creating an environment for them to succeed. If I come in and I dump all over them with, well, our bosses said this, what the heck do they know? I'm now poisoning them, and that's not my right. My right is to take them and build them up. You know, integrity, man, oh, man, some of these words are so old-fashioned, but just because it's old doesn't mean they're not new. But integrity is so huge. I, I don't know if anyone ever saw the show Fraser. It was a, a North American TV show with Kelsey Grammer where him and his brother are psychiatrists, and their father's an old beat police officer from Seattle. And they always joke that he's just a, a blue-collar grunt, and they're the elite PhDs and stuff. So one episode, they're bantering back and forth. What is integrity? What is integrity? And they're throwing definitions from Webster's and every dictionary possible. And Martin goes, you guys are full of bull. Integrity is what you do when no one's watching. He says, when I go into a, a when I'm walking the beat, if I go into a store where the front door is open and I take a chocolate bar, there's no integrity there. But, Dad, no one would know. I would know. And that's the big thing with integrity. You know what your core values are. So never deviate from that. Open minded. That's incredible. Too many people are closed minded. And that's where we fail to learn. And, and I found that um, in the post COVID world, everyone got so focused on the media and what media was presenting. And we, we, we're not being fools here. 
media is a business and people need to realize that you're going to get one side of a story, another side of the story. Somewhere in the middle is the truth. And that's the same thing when you go to a call for service as a police officer. There's one person's truth, another person's truth. Somewhere in the middle is the truth. We've got to stay open minded. And there's this thing called an amygdala hijack. And basically, the amygdala is part of our brain. And when we get into conflict, and you'd mentioned conflict the last situation, and you took some time, one, two, three, four. When your amygdala is hijacked, your brain is just going crazy. You're either going to fight, flight, or, or you're going to fear, flight, or freeze. The biggest thing you can do, and, and, and I put this to everyone in a bit of a funny situation, if they've ever had a, an argument with their significant other, then two days later, they go, oh, man, I should have said that. Or if, if people watch Seinfeld, there was that episode, oh, the jerk store called and they're out of you. But when you, <laughs> when you take your time, you're slowing the amygdala hijack down and you've got to slow that down. That's what they teach us as police officers because you'll get auditory okay. exclusion. Yes. And, and, and I look at it, we are trained that if someone comes up to you with a gun, you don't sit here and focus like this. And it's called auditory exclusion that you're going to get tunnel vision. And a lot of times when they're in conflict, they get tunnel visioned, but then you miss what's going on out here. If I focus on the one gun in front of me, maybe there's a gun coming to the left of me. So you've got to try to keep your open mind and keep your, your periphery hey, open. Douglas, I have a question here. I'm yeah. sure uh, many of the participants uh, feel the same. If you um, are in a position to, uh, you know, communicate with a closed minded, just yeah. a leader. Yeah. A colleague. What is your recommendation? How can we cope this such a challenging situation? Because uh, you have a, um, let's say, a target. You focus on your uh, job, but uh, it's, a, it's an issue you need to solve yeah. and you need to convince close-minded leaders to open the doors for you. Yeah. What is your recommendation? Uh, you. I like that. I like that question. Close minded or micromanagers. It's kind of the same thing. What I would suggest you do is a micromanager is going to say, you did it wrong. You did it wrong. You did it wrong. You did it wrong. Turn it back on them. Okay. I appreciate what you're saying, but what would you have done differently? Throw the ownership of the solution back on them. They're the ones throwing this negative spear and not prepared to come back. Because closed-minded people and micromanagers, to me, don't know how to do their own job. And they're so focused on, I don't want to worry about my job. I'm going to attack you in the smallest pieces. Throw it back to them. Hey, boss, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but tell me more about that. How would you do it differently? Hey, hey, boss, this is a great opportunity right now. I don't see where you're coming from. Help me learn. Be my mentor. Help me go through this. So then you're actually going to have to bring intelligent thought for them. And slowly they're going to go, whoa. And then at that point, just say, look, we're at a bit of an impasse right now, boss. I totally hear what you say. I want to go back and reflect on what you said. But when we come back, maybe say tomorrow, could we have a situation where you could explain this better to me in, 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 in more basic terms? And again, this is where a lot of times it gets in the problem. Put your pride and ego aside about being right. Throw it back. You're kind of mani manipulating the system. Say, look, at okay, boss, I really don't get where you're coming from. I hear what you're saying, but could we meet tomorrow and you could uh, dumb it down for me and give it to me more simpler situations? Then hopefully when they go through that process, they're going to go, geez, this didn't work. Because they're so focused on the win of being right in front of you that maybe when they go back to reflect and you come back two or three days later, they're going to come back. And I did have some bosses that way. And they'll be like, you know, Doug, I've had a chance to, to review this. And I think we should do it this way. They're going to probably say the same thing as you, but it's not going to be, I told you so. It'd be like, hey, boss, that's a good idea. And again, helping our boss be the best version of themselves, sometimes that's the win. That's the more the EQ win than the IQ win of, I told you the right thing. So uh, keyword is the EQ, not the IQ. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Uh, so uh, transferring from uh, IQ to EQ and now uh, in the artificial intelligence and digital transformation period, we, we call about uh, VQ uh, as well. You yeah. know, collective intelligence is quite important and needed for such a competitive environment. Uh, what is your recommendation for this? Thank you. I, I love AI. I think it's a fantastic tool. And that's the thing. A lot of people are using it to think for themselves. But just think about it if we're doing a report. You know, you can go into chat GPT or whatever, and you can take your thought processes. And that's the one thing. A lot of people ask me, how do I get my bosses to buy into my idea? 
but a lot of people don't realize that you're speaking to a different level and different perspective. You know, subject matter experts, we get it here, but you have to learn the speak of the people that you're speaking with. It's no different if I go to another country, I have to learn some basic words so that when I communicate with them, they understand what I'm saying. You have to realize that when you influence up, and Goldsmith talks about this fantastic, you need to learn the terms that the bosses would. You could even put in chat GPT, um, this is my idea, please reformat it in terminologies for a middle manager. That's gonna help you as a subordinate come at them way more efficient. And then again, you can tweak it back and forth. So it's gonna help you uh, collect your thoughts in, in different terms and different thought processes. I think AI would be a fantastic tool and I haven't seen it developed yet. In policing, we have artificial intelligence where you'll go into a, a box or a scenario and there'll be a critical situation and you're, you're met with some video actors and they throw different stimuli at you to elicit different responses. Just think about if someone, and if someone wants to do this, proprietary take it, just think, say you and I had a problem uh, situation where I needed to bring you up to standard at work. I had someone that I was working with that was explosive. What they did was absolutely wrong. They needed to be brought up to standard. They were actually charged under a discipline code because it was so explosive. I had been a sergeant for about nine years and I actually spoke with one of my uh, other sergeants who had only been a sergeant for a year. And I said, I want you to role play with me. I want you to be that person. And I want you to throw stimuli back at me so that when I come at you, I'm prepared. Because if you go in a, in a coaching session, if it's an insubordinate that needs to be brought up to standard, they're not going to bring that part. Of, they're going to say how you failed. My boss didn't say this. My boss didn't do this. My boss didn't do this. Just think if we could go a, into a, another room and have a bad employee and you could throw in, these are the characteristics of this person and you could have that one-on-one -on -one coaching session in that forum so that practice makes you perfect. So that when they do throw stuff, you can say, well, Cesar, that's a really good point, but I think we need to stay on point. This is what we need to do. Yeah, but you're you're an idiot. Well, Cesar, I really don't think that this is the time for that. You know, let's stick to point. If you can learn through your repetitions on how being a better leader and being a better supervisor, you're going to be way more efficient, effective, essential, and economical when we deal with those sessions. So I think AI, as long as people use it as a tool to refine what they're already doing, I really encourage it. I used it to edit my book that's coming out next month uh, for spelling because I'm not a great speller. So I wrote in there and I just said, you know, for the different chapters, spell check this. And I found different grammatical errors. So at the end of the day, my first book, I didn't use AI to spell check it. And some people said, well, there's a few grammar errors. You're like, man, that's not what I wanted because, you know, people are going to look at the negative because people don't want to celebrate the positive. This way you can tighten up your arguments. You can present yourself the way you really want, but you can't rely on it to think for yourself. You have to use it as a tool, just like a dictionary, a thesaurus and other things are tools they we use them to work for us not the other way around yeah thank you so we come coming approaching let's say to the end of our session and um before that as we are talking about the forward you know um uh, leadership style uh, what is your uh, dream about uh, you know future leadership uh, values at the end of the day i Before just we closing uh, you know sentences thank you very much we really enjoyed your session thank you the new book um just the different chapters that i want to just talk about digital mindfulness so you, you said the qualities these are the 12 qualities i hope people really incorporate their research about digital mindfulness purpose-driven leadership what are we here for what are we trying to accomplish authenticity and leadership and it comes down to integrity we've got so many leaders that do what they want to do but they don't mimic what they say we have to look about remote leadership skills. We have to develop those skill sets so that right now we're all getting along great. Unfortunately, the information I'm pushing it out, but we have to learn how to better communicate and read each other. We have to learn about adaptive learning. Uh, adaptive learning. The world is changing at an uh, incredible pace right now. And to be effective leaders, we have to be at the front of that change. I've always joked that I'd rather build the bandwagon that everyone jumps on than jump on it later myself. We have to look about inclusive leadership. And it's not all about DEI, it's about getting the right people for the job. But if you've got two people that are equal, but one feels a DEI, we've got to, we've got to be more uh, in tune towards that. Resiliency cultivation. And we see this, Harvard did a study a few years ago that said that people 20 to 30, they're the, the epics of suicide are up four or 500% because in Canada, 
no one fails grade one, no one fails grade six, no one fails grade all the way. No one ever fails. You go to university, you never fail. So you go into your job the first time and your boss says you're not up to standard and you don't have the resiliency skills to navigate that stuff. So people just crash. I think it's funny in Canada, you get a cap and gown for junior kindergarten, senior kindergarten, grade six, grade eight. You know, we not everyone gets a trophy and we have to build resiliency because we are setting generations up to fail big time. You can't say, hey, Google, what's the answer? Because Google can't do that. And there's one of the limitations of AI. We have to ensure sustainability as of the processes that we move forward. We have to be human centric in leadership with our digital age. We've got to move forward. We've got to figure out how we can use all these tools to better do ourselves. And again, the heart of leadership now, it's IQ, EQ, and you want to use AI as we talked about. The synergy of collaboration. We're collaborating right now. I hope people, are, I'm helping them, as my website says, rise up and excel moving forward. And I'm always here for future conversations. We've got to go make a worldwide audience. Our economy is global, but why are our thought processes by country? We need to be more collaborative that way. Uh, and then again, we have to have the call to action. And that's the big thing for me. What are you doing for other people? It's easy to go out there and say, me, 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 me. I'm asking you to look at we. Be kind to each other, get out there and help someone do some community service. That's where my true value comes from. And when I look at, when I go to bed every night, my challenge and my challenge to everyone right now, make one stranger smile per day or mentor a young person because you have no idea how those small acts of kindness can unleash some incredible human potential. And every day, whether it's a good day or a bad day, I'll lay down there and in my personal reflection, my positive mindset, I will say, I made you smile, Cesar. Lindy, I made you smile. So I earned that day. And when we're dumping on ourselves saying we did a bad thing, maybe we're gonna start to cut ourselves some slack and realize that we're humans too. And again, yes. we gotta take care of ourselves before we take care of others. So make one stranger smile per day or mentor a young person. And I want people to send me their four core values, whereas that we've got already five. Those are my secrets to success. It's very simple, but if we template that every day and we wake up in the morning with positive psychology and don't go into the mirror and go, oh, I'm bald today, oh, you know, how many people wake up in the morning and they, they dump on themselves and go, oh, I'm looking older. Start your day in a positive. Hey, today I'm gonna make one stranger smile. Boom, positive, and the rest of your day is gonna take off. Start your day in the positive, end it on the positive. Have a great night's sleep and leave with your best self. Thank you so much. Now uh, for the closing uh, comments, Lindy, Prof. Lindy, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Cesar. Um, wow, I, I wanted to ask so many questions and I wanted to jump in so many times. This is fantastic and it's so valuable and so inspiring, Doug. Thank you so much. It's really inspiring and, and we feel your energy. I think to me, what stands out, even from a corporate perspective, in this age of the fourth and fifth industrial revolution, of digitalization, of WeQ, um, we're still human. And if our basement is flooded, then you know we can't even speak to our values and be our best selves. Mm -hmm. So it's so important to remember that we are human, but also those around us are also human beings that we work with. So I think our comments also said it all. So from my side, Thank you so much, Doug and Cesar. It really is a privilege to have you on board. And I'm certain we're going to have a lot of views of this recording on our website and YouTube channel as well. So to our attendees, thank you for joining us tonight again or today again. <laughs> Please be sure to visit our website, the Good Governance Academy, and also to subscribe to our YouTube channel where you'll see all these valuable recordings shared for free. So a special thank you to our presenters for sharing their knowledge with the, and uh, our audience, a broad international network in the pursuit of making the world and corporate governance better. So thank you so much. And then also to the Good Governance Academy and the Research Forum and Carolyn, Everyone, thank you for the platform where we can do use to do good work. So from our side, that's all for today. Thank you very much and be and join us again soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.